that's yeah the, the most important thing is to best to find the best people so to find the best people every day i do working meetings working meetings so i spend two to three yeah two working meetings yeah working meetings so every day i spend two to three hours walking in a park usually it's a restaurant so for the guys who go to a restaurant you can see me there quite often summer winter whatever the weather or almost i go and have working meetings in the restaurant Salutare! Sunt Cosmin Costea, fondatorul Ecomasters. Ecomasters ajută concret magazinele online cu servicii de consultanță e-commerce, implementare tehnologie și marketing online. Din 2005 am lucrat cu peste 100 de antreprenori și manageri în e-commerce și am ajutat pe toți să-și crească businessul online. Așa te putem ajuta și pe tine. Aplică pentru o sesiune de 30 de minute de consultanță gratuită. Poți afla exact cum să-ți crești vânzările e-commerce folosind un model de creștere validat în șapte pași și tactici de marketing online. Identificăm provocările tale și primești live sfaturi concrete. Nu este despre efort, este despre rezultate. De asta cererea e mare și locurile sunt limitate. Intră pe ecomasters.ro slash consultanță și aplică la sesiunea gratuită. Salutare Greg, bine ai venit la e-commerce pe concret podcastul comunității Ecomasters. Cum îți spun? Zim cum îți spun. Îți spun Greg? E ok? Greg sau uh, Gregor sau Grigore sau uh, Grigore Vigrulescu, dacă vorbim uh, limba română acum. <laughs> Mulțumim că ai venit să ne povestești cum să faci un startup. Asta vreau să aflu de la tine în e-commerce și în orice altceva. Mulțumesc foarte mult că m-ai invitat, Cosmin. Merci. Cu drag, cu drag. E o onoare pentru mine să fie aici. Am citit atât despre tine. Și ne-am cunoscut acum 10 ani când tu ai înființat în România o firmă care se chema Callpoint, mi-aduc aminte, și care acum face parte dintr-un grup mult mai mare. Spune-ne în câteva cuvinte povestea asta. Când, când ai venit în România, de fapt, și cum a început businessul sau activitatea ta sau viața ta în România? Și mă gândesc că, scuză-mă că te întrerup, e confortabil să vorbim în, în română sau mai bine trecem în engleză și abordăm și poate niște termeni mai tehnici și mai, dacă, mai confortabili. Dacă ești de acord, începem cu parcursul pe care l-am avut în România, în limba română, pentru că este despre România și după când vom vorbi despre business, vom schimba în limba engleză. E bine așa? Perfect, îți mulțumesc! <laughs> Super! Am, avut, da, am, am venit în România în 2005, am lucrat un an la ambasada franței, adică, scuze, 2006 și am lucrat un an la ambasada franței dintre 2006 și 2007. Uh, și am realizat foarte repede că vreau să devin un antreprenor și am un background care este business school și MBA, business school și MBA în, în Franța. Și am lansat o firmă în aprilie 2007. Am avut foarte, foarte mult noroc pentru că am lansat o firmă mică cu 8 angajați, uh, care se numește Coldmont New Europe. Am lansat. angajați doar. Da, 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 da. Și acum firma respectivă care a devenit Telus în România și în Bulgaria are 6000 de angajați, adică a crescut oh. foarte, foarte mare, dar am făcut exitul uh, 10 ani după când am lansat. A fost cel mai lung exitul, exit pe care l-am avut în viața mea. Am lansat businessul în 2007, am vândut în 2017, dar sot, sunt totuși implicat în firma asta. Nu mai sunt acționar, dar uh, sunt implicat în non-executive non role ca administrator uh, și uh, board member. Și este o firmă superbă care se numește Telus International și, și uh, de fapt face call center în uh, 20 de limbi aici în București și în Craiova și în Sofia și în Plovdiv în, în Bulgaria. Și este cel mai mare business pe care l-am am lansat în viața mea până acum. Foarte, foarte tare. Am o întrebare tehnică pentru oamenii din e-commerce. De multe ori începem un business e-commerce și angajăm o echipă de customer care care să ofere suport clienților noștri pe, pe voce sau pe text. Și la un moment dat începem să ne gândim că poate nu e cea mai eficientă metodă să avem toată echipa în in-house. Și atunci poate ne gândim că ar fi bine să avem, cum numim noi, un first level support externalizat, care poate să răspundă la întrebări relativ ușoare și un second level support care să răspundă la întrebări grele care vin de la clienți. Care e perspectiva ta? Tu cum zici că ar fi mai bine? Și tu cum ai văzut de la business-uri că procedează? Uh, so, so first of all, I think that uh, whenever the volumes, whenever a company starts and needs customer support, and whenever the volumes do not require more than you know 
eight to ten FTEs, so full time uh, um, um, equivalents. I don't think it's it, it's uh, it's healthy. I don't think it makes sense uh, to to outsource. I think that whenever a company discovers the world of uh, customer service, it's good to have for them to have their own resources, their own internal sources resources, and only when the size of the team, because the volumes of calls or email or chat or you know, social media, whatever type of interactions, whatever the channels, whenever it really uh, reaches a certain size, to me, the threshold of around 10 FTs, then it really okay. starts to make sense to outsource. And the good thing of for organization to start having those customer experience teams in, internally is that they start to understand this world and they start to master it so that they can better handle their relationship with outsource providers, outsource uh, partners uh, in, 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 a, in a longer term, right? So that would be my recommendation. And as you said very well, if the volumes get very, very big, there can always be a level one support and a level two, uh, two support, one uh, being handled um, by an outsource partner and the rest of the calls, which are maybe more tricky, more specific, more complicated, complicated to handle or more, more sensitive, yes, it, it, it can make sense for the organization to keep it uh, internally. We, we have been working with many, many uh, clients uh, having those, those, those different uh, needs. Anyway, right now in Romania, it's very hard to find a contact center company that can take volumes which represents a workload for less than 10 FTEs. Most contact centers would not want to start that because actually for a contact center company, uh, the complexity of handling a small project or a big project is relatively the same. So they would rather okay, focus big. on big ones, you know. For example, in Teles International in, uh, in, in Romania, we only take prog programs which are more than 30 to 40 FTs. We, we don't look for projects uh, below this, this uh, threshold. Because of the initial setup cost or overhead cost that is, doesn't make it... Uh, yes, and the resources, the management resourcing, project management resources, training resources, quality uh, uh, monitoring resources, uh, everything. I mean, so... And we, we are very lucky, right? Because we have the luxury in Teles International to be in a, in a position, a luxury position to refuse... Or, uh, or take or not, I mean, uh, some, some, some new clients. So because we have this luxury, we really want to focus on big companies for big volumes, of course. And whenever we, we are approached by companies for smaller volumes, we say, no, we are really sorry, we, we can't help you. Unless those are very, very fast growing companies, like big startups that uh, might potentially become you know, uh, much, much bigger. In that case, yes, it's a bet that we're making on this company. We start small, maybe 20 FTEs, and we hope we can uh, scale to 50 or 100 FTEs in, uh, relatively quickly. Sorry, I, I talk too much. Uh, whenever you are going to, I'm so passionate about this line of business and all the others. So I will try to keep my answers uh, shorter in the next uh, questions. I feel the passion and it's, uh, and it's great. Again, a specific question. Uh, we're going to go back to your, your story, but uh, I'm really interested in really specific questions for e-commerce. Do you have e-commerce uh, companies that... Uh, use your services uh, now yes so uh, for the contact center part or uh, in other business yeah uh, for, for for the for the telus business yes actually we serve many many uh, e-merchants e-commerce is really an industry that requires lots of customer service of course contrary to retail you go and you buy something in a physical shop you are not going to interact uh, in, I mean, in a few cases, but usually you are not going to interact with customer service. But whenever indeed you buy something online, then because of the delivery, because of the invoices, because of many reasons, you are potentially going yeah. to interact with uh, with the contact center agents. So this is why we have many, many clients uh, in, in, in e-commerce that we serve from here, from Bucharest and from Cryova. Absolutely. Mostly uh, email, that. chat, uh, phone, of course, as well as social media. Those four uh, channels. We are multi, multi channel four and multi, channels. Multi, we have four channels, multi channel and multilingual. And for, for social media, you do the organic interaction, uh, basically replying to posts, yes. to comments of, uh, of customers. Yeah. What, what we see basically is that nowadays the younger generations, instead of uh, giving you a phone call, uh, for whatever uh, uh, reason that is uh, related to the delivery, the invoicing or whatever, in many cases, they are going to interact with you online because this is where they spend lots of time. So for us, in terms of typologies, 
sometimes there is no difference between an email, a chat, a call, and a request on, 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 uh, on social media. So that's why increasingly our clients are willing us to handle this part as well, social media, as well as community management. We start actually with uh, customer interactions via social media, and then we also start with community management, increasing the size of their communities online, posting, uh, 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 publishing posts on their behalf, etc. Yes, our role becomes more and more digital. Mm -hmm. I see. So you're not only basically replying, so taking calls or chats or texts, you are also initiating the conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I see. And you cover only local, let's say Romanian and Bulgarian uh, e-commerce companies, or you cover international? Because you said you're multilingual. Mostly international. Mostly international. We, we do... We work with uh, companies, uh, French companies, uh, so selling beauty products, uh, selling um, tires online. I mean, very, very wide range of, uh, of, of products. Um, our strength here in Romania, because, and this is why we are very gifted to be in Romania and to have started this business in Romania, is the fact that Romanians, of course, they speak very well foreign languages. And this is where we are very strong. Mm -hmm. For some of these immersions, we serve them, serve them in 15 languages, right? 15, one, five. So we start with French, English, German, Spanish, etc. And those e-commerce companies growing so fast to new markets, it increases their needs and requirements in terms of new languages. So we had more languages on top all the time. And when you come in our offices, we have amazing, we have 10,000 uh, square meters, nice offices in Afi, next to the Afi Mola, Afi Kotochen. And you can hear lots of different languages from fl French to Turkish, even Greek, Scandinavian languages. Very hard to recruit Scandinavian language speakers, but we find them anyway. Uh, so yeah, you know, it's 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 a very interesting business because the multilingual exposure, the multi multicultural exposure is absolutely fantastic. And immersions are some of our yeah, it's one of our top verticals. I have a small uh, curiosity of myself, and then a may maybe heavier question. So the curiosity is, when does it? Uh pay off to have 24 hour support instead of business hour support for an e-commerce player? So uh, we have some clients uh, that are in, uh, let's say, sensitive uh, industries, you know, like medical uh, health. And, uh, you know, sometimes it can be a matter of life and death if uh, you are not able to provide uh, the required support at the right time. So whenever it's, the industry is sensitive and requires 24 seven, it's a must. Uh, and most of the time, but for e-commerce, for e-commerce, it's a I matter mean, of budget. I mean, I mean, all immersions would like potentially to have a twenty-four-seven support, but then it comes to to, to to pricing and how much is going to cost them, and uh, and because it's it, it gets uh, more expensive, of course. So having agents working night shifts and uh, also uh, during the during the weekends. So what we do for that to immersions is very simple. We basically blend the agents. We say, look. We cannot, I mean, it's, if it's too expensive for you to pay teams of agents to work at night and during the weekend, maybe what we can have is to have pooled teams, blend, agents who are going to work for you as an emergent, but also for other uh, emergents, up to three, four different accounts so that we can, you are not going to pay per hour and per agent, but you are going to pay per interaction, you know, and uh -huh. that works better. So then emergents, they can afford it and they are not going to pay for Agents just waiting for taking calls or emails, which does not happen with the same type of volumes at night or during the weekend. But having in mind that they are blended, it, it becomes more affordable. Definitely. Thanks for sharing that. Now to a more uh, heavier question, let's say, how do the systems work that the agents uh, access? I mean, do they access the actual customer systems? Do you have, they have a separate interface? How many screens i would say they see they see the call center screen the back end of the customer screen how does this work and how complex it is it so we have lots of uh, different uh, crms depending on the type of project depending on the client sometimes the client come to us and say like this is uh, the, the these are the tools that i that i use and uh, sometimes we take the tools as they are uh, sometimes we recommend other tools because this is something very important is that we don't see us as purely uh, um, 
suppliers executive the work that is being given to us by our clients. We do some kind of audits. We are consultants, you know. So whenever a client comes to us and say like, okay, I need 100 FTEs in this language, this language, this language, in the, on this channel and this channel. What we do is that we audit everything. We have a team of BPO consultant. We are going to go through yeah, all the processes, um, the training materials, the documentation, etc., and the tools, including the CRMs that you mentioned. We say like, you know what? Maybe this CRM is not the best for you because of X or an F mm -hmm. of, of A and B, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So usually we recommend some uh, some some other uh, CRMs unless we consider that they are the best uh, suited for, uh, for the project. And um, so we are trying to have one single tool uh, per, per project so that people uh, and our agents do not have to go from one CRM to the, to the other, which unfortunately happens from time to time. We're trying to, catch, to try to keep things as easy and smooth as possible. I see. It, uh, it makes sense. I didn't know that you are also giving like advice on the best CRM or the best process for... Uh, for handling customer care or customer Yeah, support. we have been in this business like that for so cool. many years. We have been serving so, accounts which are so different. We have access and experience with some tools which are so innovative. Then the least we can do whenever a client uh, put their trust in our services, in our brand, in our teams, the least we can do is to really show that our level of expertise and need to help them to be more productive and to deliver uh, more quality services, yeah. So, you sold your uh, your call point business to Telus, basically. But like in between, did you also start other startups, or after you sold, you started your startup uh, frenzy? I don't know. <laughs> it seems like you're always launching a new a new startup. Yeah, I couldn't help myself. I mean, I uh, I said like, okay, till I didn't, uh, till I'm not. I've not sold Cold Point. I'm not going to launch any startup, but I could not prevent myself. So I, I launched two other startups that I sold also. Really? Uh, one of them, uh, yeah, one of them was Car Media. It was a guerrilla marketing agency that I create. I launched, I think, in 2010. I sold in 2012 to a group, an Italian group of investors. And around the same period, I created a company, a gift box company, uh, and uh, named Emova. And I sold the company to Chec de Genet, to ah, Up yep. Group. French uh, meal vouchers company that I'm, I'm close to, by the way, for other reasons and related to one of my more recent uh, startups. So yes, yes, I created and launched two startups in between, between the time I launched Call Point and the moment I, I saw them. But the exit was much smaller than uh, the one I had with uh, with, with Call Point now Telus International, which is really the big uh, the big fish in my uh, in my uh, fishery story, if I could put it like this. It's, it's, yeah, it was it was a nice adventure and a big beautiful company. Um, and a big, beautiful buyer, Telus International, is really a good company that I love from the cultural point of view. It's not only about money, of course. Entrepreneurial uh, stories and business stories are, are not financial adventures. It's human uh, adventures before all. And I, I remain very, very good friend with my business partners. And I, I have very, very good relations with this super company. And I'm so happy that we can uh, continue our growth in the, in the region by 6,000 employees in Romania and Bulgaria. Wow. And we uh, keep growing. We keep on growing. That is amazing indeed. But how do you do you do a startup? I mean, you just go by gut, by feeling. I mean, not the idea of the startup, but the management and the setup and the growth of the startup. Or do you have some kind of business model of way of working model or processes to set it up initially and then to, to grow it to a, I don't know, sellable size? I, uh, I have a modus operandi which is uh, written. I have 100 pages of modus operandi. You have. Can you share my that Bible. with me? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's, it's, a, it's my, what I call my Bible uh, that I use with my business uh, partners, uh, with my, uh, my, my pack, what I call my pack, my pack of words. We are 15 guys. I'm surrounded by 15 guys. Unfortunately, there is no woman. I, I need to change that. I need to have women entrepreneurs in, 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 in my uh, circles. And uh, basically, every time we launch a new startup, with some of them, usually I present the project to everyone. It, we, we never start out of a new idea coming from nowhere. It's very structured. Uh, so I'm going to tell you how it works. So first of all, the way I start my days is always the same. This morning was no exception. I spent 30 minutes sharp every single morning screening at the news, tech news, startup news from France, Germany, UK, and the US. 
And whenever I find an idea that I say like, oh, I like this idea, there is big potential. It already skyrockets abroad. There might be potential in Romania. When I ha whenever I fall in love with this idea, this idea, an idea and I believe that there is a potential in Romania, it, it might be the right time. I send this idea, this idea and uh, the, some, uh, the, the article to a group within the group of my uh, 15 uh, words and to those who have a, 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 concert, a background in consulting, right? A very smart guy, very sharp and say like, guys, can you have a look? They do have a look. And a couple of weeks after they got back to me and said like, oh no, this idea is not going to work. Timing is not uh, right. Or competition is coming to, uh, very soon. Or whatever reason, it cannot work because of the cultural landscape or the business landscape in Romania. Or they say like, yes, there is potential. We have identified potential. And in, in case but potential has, has, has been identified, then we go to a deeper research. We do focus groups with potential uh, consumers. Uh, if yeah, we, we, we meet with uh, corporate partners in case we are going to need to, call, to onboard some big corporations at one point in the project as clients, as partners, whatever. And only at the end of this chain, if we really consider that is the right time, the right project, we are going to use a team of those 15 guys to say like, okay, you guys, we appoint a CEO, we appoint a CTO, and we appoint a CCO. And then we launch and scale as, as fast as possible. CCO? In the modicipal, the chief commercial officer. Chief commercial, yeah. officer. chief commercial officer, chief technical officer, technology officer, and chief technology officer is enough. To be. And, uh, and then we, we launch and we scale as fast as we can. And for the scaling, we also have a chapter in our modus operandi. We also have a chapter in our modus operandi. How do we do with financing? Depending on the type of project, we are going to go for a business angel at that point moment or VCs. If yes, what kind of business angels, what kind of VCs? Actually, I found, I'm, I'm founding the first start. I'm, I found the, 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 the launch. And we did the, the seed funding usually after four to six months. It was very, very fast. In the case of my latest startup, Bonapleteco, we did the seed funding. We raised 800,000 euros two months after we launched. It was the quickest 800. fundraising. And the app yeah, is doing? It. So uh, Bonap is an amazing, it's one of my uh, favorite projects. I love it. It's basically a mobile app that fights food waste. If you are using the app, you download bonap.eco. On your phone, and it's going to give you access to food at a discounted price between 50 to 80 percent less expensive. It can be the retailer across the counter, counter, supermarket, hypermarket, whatever. It can be a restaurant, it can be a bakery, it can be a gas station, any, any, it can be a hotel. Any type of places that sell food can be enrolled in our application. And basically, if they have food that, that is about to expire tomorrow or in the next few days. They put the, the description of the food of the box in the application and you as a user, you are going to go there and to take your box at a discounted price of 50 to 80 percent less expensive. It's great for the retailer because the retailer is going to save lots of money from wasting because all retailer throw away too much food. So for them, it's additional revenue. It's less waste. It's more traffic on the, on the, on the, on the store. And for the user, it's great, especially with inflation stri striking, especially in Romania, having in mind that 40% of the money, 40% of the money from Romanian households go into buying food. It's 10% in France and Germany, right? So uh, Romania is the best 10? country. 10 in it's 10%. 10% of the money of a French or a, a German family goes into food. It's 40% in, in Romania. So okay. we offer the possibility to Romanian households to buy food at a discounted price. Plus this year with inflation, unfortunately inflation is going to strike even harder. So it's an anti-crisis, it's an anti-fragile solution for retailers, for the consumers and also for the planet. Because food waste represents 10% of the global CO2 emissions. So yeah, it's a, it's a virtuous uh, cycle that we are having with uh, Bonap.eco. I'm very proud of it. We launched in November, so we are very a baby startup, right? We launched only in, in November. We already have 300 partners. We sell more than 200 boxes per day. And we are now preparing the Series A uh, funding because we need to raise more to expand qu more quickly even. Now we are present in Bucharest and in Cluj. It's not enough. We need to be in many more uh, Romanian cities. We need to expand to Hungary, uh, to uh, Bulgaria, of course, uh, Moldova, and uh, maybe Greece as well. So you you got eight hundred thousand euro in the seed phase. 
Did I get it right? To, yeah, eight weeks after eight weeks after we launched the business. Eight weeks after we launched the business. Okay, that is uh, amazing. But I guess this is yeah. your uh, your magic. Uh, what do you need money for, uh, actually? For people, S technology. Sales. Uh, mostly sales, no technology. Uh, I mean, I, we, li we, we like to take shortcuts, really. So we bought the technology. Actually, we didn't even develop the technology by ourselves. And this is, I think, one of the things we, we like to take shortcuts because we don't want to waste too much time. We don't want to waste too much money. So when we decided to launch Bonap, we said, okay, my, my, my team said, like, Greg is going to take us one year to develop the app. It's going to cost us 100K. I said, guys, we cannot burn one year. We are not going to burn 100K in the technology. So we started discussing with similar companies doing the exact same businesses in other countries. Up until we found a company in Central Europe, we said like, yes, I have the app and I'm happy to sell the app to you. So we bought the app. They still keep their, the app and it's up and running. You bought the country. technology or the actual? We, bu we bought a copycat of the technology. Okay. And now we, are, we also own the technology and we are developing uh, the, our, te the te the, our technology on top of this technology. But we saved uh, so many months. We, saw, we saved so much, uh, so much money. I like to take shortcuts to, to, to save time and, and, and to go as fast as possible. So this is true for technology. This is true for fundraising. We raise the money very, very, very fast. Um, I, 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 actually, it's, it's all about timing, right? I really believe that in, when it comes to business, it's really all about timing. You can have the best idea in the world. If you believe now is the right time, you should take the opportunity now. And it's not about feelings. It's about being backed by market research, by listening to your competition, by uh, listening to your clients, by listening to your partners, in our case, big corporations. Because we mostly work with big corporations. We are strong in B2B, in retail especially. Mm -hmm. We work with, you know, with Cora is one of our top partners. Uh, Penny is working also very well with uh, with Bonap with this application. We are currently onboarding three other big big retailers. So yeah, it's it's great for retailers. It's really huge. Frankly, it's huge. It's huge. They provide so many so much food in so many shops. You now I was discussing with uh, one of my uh, one of our competitors in France because I like discussing this competition all the time before even I launched the businesses so that I can also potentially have a future exit. So I was discussing, I was in Paris a few weeks ago, discussing with one of our top competitors in the, in the West. And they said like, you know, for one big hypermarket, the number of boxes of food that they generate is 100. So 100 boxes of food. So it's, it's, it's huge, right? So, so the potential in Romania is, is, is as big, is not even bigger than, than in France. I see. Come I like this kind of business. Yeah, sorry. I, I see, I see your passion. Coming back to your 100 pages, uh, way of working manual uh, did you yeah did you write that yourself i guess you did but did you get inspired by some uh, business operating system uh, maybe like from eos or any other operating system that it's uh, so popular nowadays yeah, that's a very good uh, question actually it's the first time someone asked me this yes we took some inspiration uh, from a German company named Rocket Internet. So Rocket Internet is a yep. startup studio that you, I mean, I'm sure you are about, uh, you, you are aware about, uh, aware of. Um, basically, those are these uh, three uh, German brothers uh, named the Samberg brothers. In the beginning of the year 2000, uh, they say, okay, we, it would be great to launch uh, successful businesses inspired in Europe, inspired by uh, North American uh, startups that are Skyrockets. So they go to uh, California, they meet with lots of corporations trying to understand how they work. They meet with the top management of eBay and they say like, you know what? Uh, we would like to launch uh, eBay for you in Europe because eBay would be very successful. The guy said, no way, we are not interested in Europe for the moment. The three Germans, they go back to, uh, to Germany, uh, I think in 2004, 2005, they launched a copycat of eBay. Everything was really looking like eBay. Even the logo had the same colors. The sections of the website was, it was too much of a copycat for me, you know, it was more than inspiration. It was really a copycat, but you know, this imitation model worked so well that a couple of years after eBay bought 100% of the company that took okay. the inspiration from there. And the Samuel brothers said like, oh, you know what? It's very interesting. So what we are now going to do, we are going to identify, to scan and to learn from all the next big successful e-commerce startups from the, the USA. And we are going to do a copycat. We are basically going to do a copycat factory. And we are going to launch many startups every year. And this is what they did. 
and uh, they had the 27 exits, 27 exits so far from doing that since 2007, yeah. since 2007, because they started. I see. Yeah, Did they, they uh, write about their business model? Uh, yes. I think that they wrote a book, right? They, they, they wrote books. They, they have this modus operandi. I could never find this modus operandi because, of course, it's highly confidential. But uh, the idea of having uh, such methodology, I took it. However, we are not doing things the exact same way. I mean, first of all, we are not launching so many startups with, with my, with my uh, team of business partners. We launched one to two startups per year, which is already a lot, you know. Um, and we don't do, I don't like the, the idea of copying. I mean, we are not a Chinese it factory, a right? Bit, uh... Uh, I don't know. It's like uh, singing other people's uh, songs, you know? You need to start somehow writing your own songs. Yeah, but you never write a song. No song is ever uh, coming from nowhere. I mean, any singer takes some inspiration for the, for the lyrics, for the music, for the scenery whenever there are concerts, based on previous singers. And I think it's, it is the exact same uh, thing when it comes to business. You never start from zero. And, yeah. you, and you, when you are looking at the most successful companies in the world when it comes to technology, none of them was the first uh, starter. One, none of them was a, the pioneer. It really? was all company. So? Yeah, it was all companies taking inspiration from an existing model. Tesla But didn't about... invent. Tesla <laughs> didn't invent electric cars. Google in, didn't invite, invent a search engine. Facebook didn't invent social media. Amazon didn't invent uh, selling books online or even e-commerce. They came later on, identifying what the leaders, the pioneers were doing. They came as outsiders, trying to outperform the leader. The world How of about success, first mover advantage? I don't believe that much in first mover advantage. Uh, unless you are very strong enough to capitalize on uh, on it, but uh, the history, the recent history of technology, at least in the past 10 years, shows us that the future belongs to outsiders rather than pioneers. But there are exceptions, right? Uber is an exception. There was no Uber before Uber. So, um, yeah. The, 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 so we are we are a bit in the middle in the in terms of what are the startups that I launched because. We are always a pioneers locally in our region because we take inspiration from existing pioneers, but that already perform in, the, in North America or in Western Europe. But we are pioneers locally. So this is, I think, is the key, right? This is the, that was the key for um, Rocket Internet, and I believe this is our key, of course. This is why our companies work so well. It's not blind, right? I mean, sometimes we something that works very well abroad, for whatever reason, it's not the right timing here, so we don't launch. But in most cases, you know, all the highly successful startups eventually from the US, eventually they will come to Western Europe. And eventually then they will come to Eastern Europe. So we have and a chronology. They want to buy a local player. And they want to buy a local player. And this is our exit plan, our exit strategy. We never launch a startup unless we have an exit plan. This is part of our Bible, our modus operandi as well. We need to anticipate any scenario. Not that we want to sell any company that we are launching. But we know that at one point in the process, we might want to really be willing to sell because we might have a bigger idea or another startup in which we want to involve more a time, more energy, or you know, or maybe the, the cash burn is too high and we don't want to support a big carbon. The potential is still here, but it's taking more time. So in that case, we can be willing to sell the company. This is what happened to my uh, one of my latest startups named Phoenix. Phoenix that echo. I, I love this business. It's about refurbished smartphones. How did it start? 2019, I uh, read a French uh, newsletter about technology in startups. And I hear about the back market. What is a back market? It's a marketplace in France selling refurbished phones. So like, what? This company is already a unicorn. It was launched three, four years ago. It's already a unicorn by just selling refurbished phones online. Then I do a little bit of digging. I see that At that time, it was 15% of the smartphones, smartphones, smartphones sorry, sold in France were refurbished. Now it's 20%. I said, oh man, that's huge. So I asked my guys who are smarter than I am to run a diligence and market research. They come back to me and say, like, Greg, it's an amazing business. We need to launch this in Southeastern Europe. We launch as soon as we can. I put 260,000 euros on the table to, for the launch because we needed to build 
big inventories, big stocks, so that we could have enough references, enough volumes. I launched this company in Romania in April 2020, 14 months after one four. 14 months after, I sold 100% of the business to the, the, the number two player in uh, Western Europe named Recommerce Group. It was the quickest exit for a Romanian startup. It was an e-commerce web, sh web shop. It was my first e-commerce, pure e-commerce uh, uh, business, Phoenix Zateco. We, we were selling oh. just smartphones online, and 14 months after uh, launching the business, I sold 100% of the business. I'm still involved with the company today as a senior advisor. I support the company to grow in Romania and to uh, expand in... Uh, in uh, we just uh, launched in uh, Hungary, Greece, uh, uh, and uh, Moldova. It's, it's, it's a skyrocketing uh, business. And now in uh, Romania only, we sell 2,000 phones per month. 2,000 phones per month. I have the notes I just checked before our call. Uh, that makes a, 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 a monthly revenue of 400,000 euros. We sell for 400,000 euros of smartphones refurbished in Romania only. Whereas I launched a company in April 2020, and that it belongs to a e-commerce group for since July, June 2022 only, right? So this business is skyrocketing. So when, can you imagine whenever uh, we will reach in Romania the same the same figures as in France and Germany? So twenty percent of the market being made of refurbished smartphones, you know. So four what does million. It mean refurbished. So this is a refurbished phone. So I have a I have a refurbished uh, um, smartphone myself. Uh, so uh, basically, I bought it of course from uh, from Recommerce. Uh, it comes with a twelve months guarantee, with new accessories. And it looks like it's perfect. I mean, uh, it's just that it has been pre-owned. It was just, it was secondhand, but it went through our factories. And in our factories, if there are scratches on the screen, we replace the screen. If the battery is not fully functional, we replace the battery. So basically, we sell phones which are secondhand, but we transform them like new. And we sell them with a 12 months guarantee with new accessories. And it works perfectly, especially, again, I, I, I like the idea of launching projects or services which are suited to our times. People try to make some savings. People uh, try to think now about the environment. So what's better than a food waste application? What's better than a refurbished smartphone? Perfect timing. It sense. It's all about timing. So I can see how you get your customers for better prices, obviously, and uh, these guarantees. But how do you get your uh, supply? So we don't buy uh, our phones, our second-hand phones from individuals because it would be too, compli too complicated. Some companies do that. Huh? You know, Flip.show, by the way, Romanian companies, very smart guys. If they see me here, hello, guys, you rock. These guys, they do an amazing, these guys, they do an amazing job. They, very, they are very strong operationally speaking. They source their phones from individuals. I was too lazy to do that. Uh, so what we do is that we buy, and you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. They do it amazingly, but it's what's complicated for me. So what we do is that we buy phones from uh, telcos because telcos, they have lots of buyback. You know, if you want to buy the latest from, from Orange, from Vodafone, we give you a former phone and you are going to have a discount. So big, big telcos, they have big banks of phones. What do they do with these big phones? We buy them from them. In our factories, we transfer the phones like new, and we sell them back through telcos because our phones in Romania, for example, uh, one of our biggest partners in Romania is Orange. You can find our uh, e-commerce phones on orange.show. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's one of our biggest channels is selling through Orange. So we buy the phones from Orange, we resell them back through their uh, sales uh, channels. We also sell our phones in uh, Carrefour, in Cora, in Ocean, and many other partners. I have a French connection. You heard Orange, French brands, of course. Uh, I mean, I do business, of course, with uh, lots of different companies. But the fact that I'm French and I, uh, I have a, a good network of in, in the business world in Romania, but through the fact of being French, it's been uh, proven uh, somehow uh, helpful because, you know, for example, for retailers, some of the retailers I, I work with, I, I work with through different startups, with three different startups, some of the retailers. Bonap.eco, the mobile uh, application, uh, the refurbished phones, we have uh, corners of e-commerce corners in, 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 in shops, in, in big retailers, in supermarkets, in hypermarkets. Uh, I'm also uh, one of the owners of a very nice company named Bitcoin Romania. So we have crypto ATMs you in have? retail. So in Carrefour, crypto ATMs. So it looks like a regular ATM. 
But instead of using your credit card to withdraw money, you are going to use this ATM to withdraw Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other cryptocurrencies or sell those okay. uh, currencies for cash. This is incredible. We have those. You might have seen this. For example, in Carrefour, it, work, it works uh, very well. In uh, Ocean, it works very well. In Ocean, I think we have 40 or 50 ATMs, if you can believe. So we basically have one square meter of space near the entrance, usually, next to a plug, and you have our Bitcoin on there. And we enjoy the traffic of all the people who go in and out. And it's an incredible business because increasingly people are interested in cryptocurrencies, even though it's going a bit down here, but this is pure distraction. I mean, the lovely volatility of cryptocurrencies. Let's not go in that uh, rabbit hole. The, the long exactly. Let's, exactly. No, no, you're right. Let's, uh, let, just to finish on the cryptocurrency uh, ATMs, it's an amazing business. So amazing that we're now uh, uh, deploying to other uh, countries so, uh, with my support to the West, right? A Romanian crypto ATM company. Uh, deploying in uh, retail in uh, Western Europe. That's going to be a very nice uh, story. I see. Coming back to e-commerce. Uh, so a lot of times uh, our um, customers and partners uh, who want to start an e-commerce business uh, start from the technology. So which technology should I use? How did you yeah, how did you start? How did you cover this these topics? Did you start from the customer, from the supplier, from the technology, from the go-to-market strategy? How did you initially thought about this? Uh, so taking inspiration uh, from the technology that's been used by the companies that are highly successful in other markets. That's very easy. Looking at the, the top performers abroad and seeing what type of technology they uh, works the best. Because they went through, I mean, the assumption is the following. The assumption is that if an e-commerce company is successful, as so many clients has been deploying to so many countries, we bet that they have uh, strong uh, tech teams. We bet that the CTO uh, works well. We bet that they already went through mistakes, wrong technologies, so that they can end up using the current technology. And uh, so again, it's about inspiration. I see. Tell me more about your uh, your day. So you start with a 30 minute, uh, really focused uh, scan of whatever happens in the world. Then do you have a structured day or you just go by year? Yeah, uh, so my time really, I mean, my focus on companies really depend on their timing. So whenever I launch a new company, my time is very dedicated to it. And also I'm surround, I need to say it's very important. I'm surrounding myself with people who are smarter than I am in some different areas, such as operations. I'm not good, very good at operations. So I have operation stars, really like high flyers. Um, and, and basically my value, and, I, and it's very important, I know my weaknesses, I know my strengths, so I'm trying to support my startups where I'm stronger at, you know. My thing is business development, right? I'm a business developer, I'm a networker, right? I can pretty much have a lunch or dinner with any CEO in Romania or almost any CEO in Romania. I can pretty much uh, be uh, placed in front of uh, clients for a pitch and I can pretty much, uh, I, sometimes I, I'm, I try to convince them as much as I can. Same thing in front of investors, I can convince them. So, so I'm trying to use my time where I can bring the top value. And for sure not to distract my business partners doing operations or finance because I know that they are better than I am. So it's all about building complementary teams of founders, right? I don't believe in you know starting a business alone. I never did it. I always launch businesses first. Second, I always launch my businesses with friends. I think it's important because these are people I trust. Uh, if goes thing goes well or goes wrong, it's better to be surrounded by friends. And third of all, complementary profiles. I'm never going to launch a business with someone who has the exact same strengths as I have. I need to surround myself with people who have strengths where I have weaknesses so that we can build basically dream teams of high flyers. And when I say high flyers, what do I call high flyers? It's the 1%. The 1% of the people I meet with. I spend my time meeting with new people. I mean, every day I meet with new people out of recommendation, out of LinkedIn connections, whatever. And basically, when I meet 100%, sorry, 100 people, I'm going to select five to 10. These five of 10 people, I'm going to introduce them to my crew, to my gang, to my pack. They are going to, to go through these like interviews, but it's not an interview, right? it's going to be informal, etc. We are going to give these new people a project. Mm -hmm. 
just one project. They don't quit their job. We give them projects, etc. We invite them to our events, French tech events, etc. And then, if we believe that this person has the potential and that we can trust this person at the long run and bring a significant value, the next time we launch a startup, we onboard this person, and this person join uh, join our gang. So this is how we do uh, we do things. So we are extremely, extremely, extremely selective. It's all about timing, yes, but it's also all about uh, the people. And we've made some mistakes, of course. We've surrounded ourselves. So you can never be sure of anything. So, so but it costs so much time, so much money, so much frustration. That's yeah. The, the most important thing is to best to find the best people. So to find the best people every day, I do working meetings. Working meetings. So I spend two to three. Yeah, working meetings. Yeah, working meetings. So every day I spend two to three hours walking in a park. Usually it's a restaurant. So for the guys who go to a restaurant, you can see me there quite often. Summer, winter, whatever the weather, or almost, I go and have working meetings in the restaurant. A restaurant, I do working meetings 20 minutes to 30 minutes usually with new people or people that I know which can do it. We I also do some. I don't do board meetings in uh, in, in parks. But, but how do you do, do them? Because it, yeah. for me, it's important to take notes. You just do it uh, with no, no note taking uh, uh, way. You just remember what you spoke with people. Yeah, good question. I use my phone, so uh, I, I I take notes on my phone. Whenever there is something that I might not remember, which is very important, I. I while while walking, I take uh, notes on my phone. I think that walking meetings are a very interesting thing that I really recommend to any business person. First of all, when you meet someone for a walking meeting, instead of being face to face in a room, closed room, you are in open uh, space. You are in open air. With fresh air comes fresh ideas. Creativity actually improves. And I've been reading some stuff about this. Bring huh? creativity in creativity improves by sixty percent when you are doing a walking meeting rather than when you are doing a, a meeting in a, in a, in a closed uh, space. Uh, so the, the dynamics are different because you are next to the person and you walk ah, in You the walk direction. actually with the person. You don't face. talk over the phone with the person. Yes. No, no, no. Sorry. Walking ah, meeting together, together with the okay. person. So, yeah. So we meet in the restaurant. We meet in the restaurant when we walk. The good thing of being next to the person is that it's the same dynamics. You work, we, we walk by, side by side at the same speed, in the same direction. And psychologically speaking, it creates a, a, a different uh, mindset. You know what I'm saying? So this is very, very important. Plus, of course, apart from all these positive uh, outcomes, the fact of uh, working, doing lots of working meetings is good for, uh, for my health. I'm 42 years old. I want to live as long as I can. So by working so much every day, believe me, my doctor tells me. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. I see. And then, uh, so this is for the connections, for the discussions, but do you do focused work, like just sit on your, I don't know, pad or a computer and just write stuff or think about stuff or draw stuff? Um, yes, again, I'm always on my phone, uh, notes, and uh, but usually the formalization is done by, uh, by my business partner, mm -hmm. right? I, I usually come with a big picture. I usually come with the people. I usually come with the plan. I usually come with the money to launch a business. But then, you know, I have some guys who can build upon my design, who can, you know, make it work. They can build the machinery, right? I am more like a visionary, if I can say. But I, I am not an engineer. And that's why I'm surrounded by lots of engineers. Engineer makes great business persons. I mean, I work very well with engineers because I'm not an engineer at all. This is not my profile. I'm, I'm a sales oh, guy. You're and a as sales a sales guy, he's a visionary guy. I'm a sales guy. Basically, I mean, I'm. A, this is how I started when I was a student. I was um, selling printing machines in retail. I started selling printing machines in Cora and in other shops during the weekends to pay my, uh, my, my studies. I started selling and I, I've always been a seller. I think I'm, I'm a sales guy. I'm a business development guy more than sales because my big thing is about creating connections and and maintaining those connections and building trust, most importantly, right? I think reputation is everything in business. I mean, I know I told you people are everything. Timing is everything. Uh, but uh, reputation also is everything. I mean, this, this, this is also the third component. And, you know, whenever a, an investor puts money on my startups, they put the, the money partly on my name. 
whenever uh, the corporations we've been, we've been talking about retail and this show is about e-commerce whenever a retailer puts uh, um, uh, sign a contract with us it's also on my name it's not about a startup that you just launch because you know corporations they are afraid of failure and lots of people middle managers and even top managers in big organizations they they don't want to risk anything i mean they, they are risk adverse so launch working with a startup that has just been created or that is not even created <laughs> it's a power to launch how do you trust it's about the people who are behind the startups and if the people behind the startups already serve you three through, through other startups and there was never any problem and everything is going well, then here we go. And Reputation is Understood. Everything. Would you have done the same, you think, if your life would have guided you to other country when, uh, uh, when you arrived in Romania? I think it would have been much more competitive. So uh, when I was uh, an MBA student in, in Paris, uh, some of my friends, they uh, stayed, of course, they wanted to stay in Paris, many of them. So lots of French want to stay in, in France. Uh, some of them wanted to go to London, and they did. Some moved to New York, even some of them to the Silicon Valley. And I said, look, guys, I'm going to Bucharest, Romania. I said, like, Greg, are you crazy? You know, why Romania? Why don't you go to the Silicon Valley if you plan on the longer term to become an entrepreneur? I said, look, guys, Southeastern Europe is dynamic, high growth, Amazing people, culturally speaking, Romanians are close to French. People speak foreign languages. And for me, frankly, it's less competitive. If I, uh, I, I am to launch a company in the Silicon Valley, if I was to launch a company in Silicon Valley in 2007, there are people who are farmer, far more um, graduated than I am with MBAs from Stanford with access to much more capital. I didn't have access to much capital. I had an MBA, which was not the best MBA in the world. Competition is everything in terms of business, but in terms of you picturing yourself as an entrepreneur, fighting, competing with other entrepreneurs. I came to Romania. Romania is an amazing country, producing lots of super engineers, but number of successful entrepreneurs, unfortunately, there are not many. Mm -hmm. There is not a even single business school in Romania. I came with a business school background, with the MBA background, with my personality, which works in business because I'm a talkative person, I like people and they can feel it and they trust me and I trust them. And my, my mindset is, is pro-business and I'm very collaborative, right? And I didn't have much competition. Like in 2007, uh, frankly, uh, there was no business angels or, or almost not in, at that time. People were not dreaming of becoming entrepreneurs. That's, that is change, right? Of course, there is this Daniel Dines effect and UI pass. This beautiful Romanian decacon. Yes, now people start to get to realize that they should launch their startups. So, so no, I don't think I would have success. I mean, we never know, but I think that I was here at the right time, at the right uh, place, doing the right thing, building a startup. And you are also Look. an angel investor. How this, does this go? So you invest in other people's ideas. Yes, I did uh, business uh, angel investing for several years, but now I uh, decided to stop doing this temporarily because I burned so much cash in my own startups and I believe more in my own startups than in the startups of others, not out of ego, but because of our methodology. You know, at the beginning, I said like, okay, I can have great ideas, but uh, some people uh, might have better ideas than, than I have. But now, what we, what, what we managed to do is our level of fine-tuning our methodology, the risk of failure, our risk of failure is very small. When you're looking at the statistics, because I'm very, uh, I like figures, right? I love to, it's not about big ideas, it's also about backing uh, what we say by, uh, by facts. In Europe, 70 to 90% of tech startups will not survive more than four years. 70 to 90%. Uh, in Southeastern Europe, it's more in the 90, 90s. Scandinavia is more in the 70s, but the average is 70 to 90 percent. So, how can I mitigate mitigate that risk of failure? How? And my methodology, my modus operandi, my Bible, the smart imitation model that I described earlier, has been designed to make startups more likely to be successful. Has been designed to be anti-fragile. 
has been designed to have 70 to 90% of the start of our startups succeeding instead of failing. We try to reverse the statistics in our favor. Tell me something about yourself. I am aware that you do write books. Is this so? Yeah, I actually am. Uh, I, I like the idea of using my brain for something else than business. I love the world of business, right? It's my world. It's my planet. It's my universe. But uh, yeah, intellectually speaking, it's a very interesting exercise uh, to create fiction. Especially, I'm a big fan of science fiction. So, in my case, science fiction. So, indeed, very good point. I said last week, I spent an entire week in uh, in the middle of the Bulgarian mountains next to the Bulgarian the the, the sorry the Greek border okay. in order to write uh, to finish my novel. But it's 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 it's, a, it's so difficult. The difference between writing a novel and uh, launching a business is that uh, when you are writing a novel, you are just by yourself in front of your computer, or in front of your And you're right. And you just can can count on yourself. You cannot interact with people. You cannot brainstorm with people. You cannot market research. You cannot focus group people. It's just you. So it's a very interesting exercise. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just love it. But uh, the thing is that I reached 20,000, I mean, 22,000 words, which I'm halfway because to, to have a chance to be editing, to be publishing my book, I need to reach 45, even 50,000 words, ideally, to have a chance to go and to meet with the big Parisian uh, publishing houses because I'm very ambitious, right? So and my plan is clearly not to keep the book for myself, is to share it with as many readers as I can. So whenever I will re re reach the threshold of 50,000 words or 45,000, I will go and I will have my book published. If it's good enough, huh? You're writing Maybe in French? It's or? Cr it's cr I do write in French. Sure. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's crap. I have no idea. It might be. I, I find it super nice, but maybe I'm wrong. Huh? I know how to launch a startup. I don't know if I know how to read the book. <laughs> Only the future will tell us. Tell me a little bit. Uh, you said uh, you like data. What what's the the main let's say three KPIs you you focus on, on the beginning or before the beginning of a startup, and then what are your main KPIs uh, during operations? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, so I, I, because we, to, to come back to what we were saying earlier, we started with with BPO and the world of customer service. I think that Net Promoter Score is very interesting, right? NPS is very interesting. So whenever we launch a new service or a new product, the likelihood of the first clients to recommend the product or the service to their friend is absolutely crucial because it determines the appetite that people have for it. And I think that uh, for any startup that we launch, the net promoter score is key. Right? That's that's one of the most important things. Uh, clearly, the revenue and even less the uh, EBITDA or the profitability is not something we are looking at. And that people, so this is something people don't get to understand sometimes. Like, okay, but guys, you are planning to lose money for three to four years. Uh, how come this business is a, is a good business? It's a like man. Amazon lost money for 12 years before they, starting be, they started to be uh, profitable. So we live in a world where profitability should not clearly be the indicator in the first phases of the life of a, of, of a startup. Good. And then uh, when, it, uh, when it's rolling, besides uh, MPS, uh, what do you focus on? How do you actually understand if there is enough traction for your business or not? I, I think that uh, it's all about uh, pivoting all the time, pivoting all the time. I mean, you know, I launched some businesses which turned to be uh, not the best way to approach the market and our, our capability to switch, being agile, being flexible. And I'm going to take the example that we took earlier about uh, selling refurbishment phones. When we started the business in Romania, we started selling phones only online, refurbished phones only online, on our e-commerce site, phoenix.eco. It worked, but we were far from the expectations. So we started discussing with retailers. And now we sell 80% or 90% of our phones uh, um, in retail. 
we don't even have a, an online shop. I mean, we have partners like Orange that sell our phones online. So pivoting and say like, okay, guys, we launched an e-commerce business selling smartphones. We switched this completely and now we go full retail or almost full retail. Our capacity of pivoting, I think, is what makes us uh, also, uh, so successful, you know. Why? Let's not be afraid of reinventing ourselves all the time. I mean, that's the, that's the key, right? To be, not, let's not be afraid of reinventing ourselves, even though it's far from what we agreed uh, on in the first say, in the first phase. Why doesn't uh, it doesn't work in uh, selling refurbished phones online? People need to touch, to see, to. Good point. Yes, absolutely. I think that uh, especially because we are still educating the market, even though we now have big numbers, still we are still in the education phase. So exactly, good point. People they need to make sure that it's refurbished, but it works. So they see the phone, yes, indeed, no scratches as you promised. Indeed, the battery works as you promised. Yeah, I mean, especially in, people are reluctant. I mean, uh, need to, we, we need to evangelize around the, on the, around the product. So if meeting face-to-face uh, -face with, uh, with the clients, giving them the opportunity to see the, the, the product by themselves, you know, that's, that's, that's first. Second of all, it's highly competitive online. It's so competitive, I mean. People uh, were getting on uh, Phoenix the Tego, uh, Echo, uh, them on, on Flip Dot Road, the, the nice competitors that we mentioned earlier. And, uh, then on Emag, Emag uh, sometimes offering amazing discounts. Some people were complaining, like, "Oh, but you sell refurbished phones the same price as Emag?" Yes, but on this very specific bunch of products, Emag had an amazing uh, whatever Black Friday campaign or other. Uh, right, this is it. OLX also, OLX. More than two million phones are sold every year in Romania through Elix. Oh, Elix. Two million phones. Uh, it's, it's absolutely huge. It's huge. Oh, Elix is a machine. And so, uh, so people say, oh, yeah, but you are more expensive than Elix. Yes, but oh, Elix, you don't know what phone you are going to end up with. We sell you the phone with a 12-month guarantee, which Elix don't do. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. We are not peer-to-peer. -peer. So it was very competitive and hard to position ourselves. Uh, unless we were uh, we were to burn lots of money in marketing, you know, in online marketing, and we didn't want that, so we said, you know what? Let's enjoy. Let's capitalize on the great relationship we have with those big retailers in Romania. What we told them, and Ocean was the first one. Ocean was the first one. We had a booth in Ocean in the electronic devices uh, department. We started it skyrocketed. Now we are in all Ocean supermarkets and hypermarkets in all across Romania. Same with Carrefour, same with Cora. It's a blast. And we don't burn more money in marketing. We enjoy the marketing from our partners in retail because they drive so much traffic. Instead of paying people online to bring traffic to our on online shop, which is very, very, very expensive and highly, highly competitive, we enjoy the marketing and the traffic from our partner, partners in retail. For a fee, there who, is a fee there. You can't get commission. Paid, yes, I yeah. Well, I mean, we are. Uh, of course, they take a commission on the sales. That's that's me. But uh, this at the end proof is, is proving a little more uh, economically uh, uh, better than uh, fighting online. I see. What do you do? You listen to podcasts or uh, do you? I don't know. Read books, uh, articles. What are your sources of information? <laughs> Uh, so some of my business partners uh, keep uh, offering me uh, books that I never read about business. I don't <laughs> read books about business. No, no, I, 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 it's, yeah. I should. I know I should, but I, uh, but I don't. No, no, I read uh, science fiction books or books about astrology, about uh, astrophysics. You know, I'm a big fan of Steph Stephen Hawking. Not only the because of what he wrote in terms of cosmology, but also the man. You know, so that's why also my my. My role models are not business people, you know. It's not Elon Musk, it's not Bill Gates, it's not, no, no. My role models are, no. my role model is Stephen Hawking. Do English you listen to, to podcasts? Uh, not even. I don't listen to, to, to podcasts. Uh, and I should as well. But do you buy resolution. online? Do you buy online? Uh, my wife does for me, but I don't buy anything online. night. You don't? I, 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 my, I know my, my answers are so disappointing. No, no, no. I, I don't buy unless and I, I, I buy my flight tickets online. I think that's okay. pretty much the only okay. thing I buy. And my audio jungle, actually. My, uh, my audio jungle. Your, your what? 
my, 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 my audio, I, I actually, I don't even read the books. I, I, I use my uh, audio, uh, how do you call this application uh, from Amazon? Uh, uh, audible, Audible. Audible, sorry, reason. Audible. Audible. I, uh, basically, what I do is that at the end of the day, when I'm in my bed, after watching Netflix TV series with my wife, science fiction TV series with my wife, we go to bed, and I sleep with the headset, uh, listening to uh, audio books, science fiction, or books to teach how to write books uh -huh. so that I can write my own science fiction novel with the right structure, with the right characters, with the right intrigue and with the right drama and with the right heroes, the right protagonists, antagonists, etc. So I, this I learned because I don't know. So I'm a newbie in the world of writing science fiction. I'm a newbie in the world of new writing novels. So this I need to learn. Uh, frankly, in the, in, in the big, the book, big books about business, I'm, I'm getting bored. Uh, but yeah, maybe someday I should invite my business partner. So yes. Or maybe not. I, I don't see. know. Thank you very much for, uh, for your time, for sharing uh, all these things. Um, and uh, I think there are a lot of things we can still discuss on, but uh, just keep it uh, condensed and simple. So thank you for joining us uh, today. As you said, Kostrin, the cryptocurrency uh, ATMs is a big, big, big topic. It's maybe too far from e-commerce for you to invite me to talk specifically about this. So we'll see. But anyway, I thank you so much for the invitation. Mulțumesc foarte mult. Mulțumesc din suflet. A fost super. Mi-a plăcut. Și ne vedem și ne auzim foarte curând. Mulțumim. Ciao, spor. Merci, papa. Faptul că ai avut răbdare să asculti acest episod îmi spune că ești cu adevărat interesat de e-commerce și marketing online. Asta înseamnă că ai putea beneficia de suportul echipei Ecom Masters ca să-ți crești vânzările și să-ți scazi costurile magazinului tău online. Este singura echipă cu o experiență de peste 15 ani în business e-commerce. Suntem aici să ajutăm antreprenorii să-și crească businessul online. Așa că dacă vrei și tu să vinzi mai mult cu costuri mai mici, intră acum pe ecomasters.ro slash consultanță și aplică la o sesiune gratuită. Te ajutăm să clarifici care sunt provocările tale și te ajutăm să identifici soluțiile. Gratuit! Eu sunt Cosmin Costea, fondatorul Ecomasters. Și te aștept joia viitoare la un nou episod e-commerce pe concret. Și ține minte, nu este despre efort, este despre rezultate.